Okay, welcome to the third set of notes on electromagnetism. So today's notes are going to be really short. We're just going to talk about two things, which is motors and mass spectrometers. And really, these are just two um, common applications to what we've learned before, which is um, types of magnetic forces. So um, as we've seen, um, that anytime you have a current carrying wire that's uh, traveling perpendicular to the magnetic field, it will experience a force. And um, this is the phenomenon that's used by an electric motor to transform electrical energy into mechanical energy, which is to say it takes in electrical energy from, say, a battery or other power source, and it turns it into mechanical energy most often in the form of some sort of spinning part. So uh, a simple DC motor, you can see the example on the side here, uh, basically just consists of a loop of wire that passes through some sort of magnetic field. Now the ends of the loop are attached to a split ring, and this split ring is often called a commutator. And this turns around with the loop. Um, there are then fixed brushes which attach the commutator to some sort of voltage source. Now, let's take a look at how this might work. So in this example on the side here, you can see we've got uh, magnets with the north and south pole pointing this way. So you can imagine that in this region, we would have a magnetic field that would be traveling sort of to the right across our page. So our magnetic field is noted here in red. Now, let's take a look at what's happening inside this wire. So, so notice how as the field goes to the right, um, it tells us here that this is connected to the battery in such a way that the loop here is carrying electrons um, sort of into the page up this arm and then out of the page along this arm. So our current sort of goes into the page here in this section of wire and then out of the page here through this section of wire. So if you take your, um, your left hand and point your left thumb into the page, because we're talking about electron flow here, and then your uh, finger uh, moves to the right to indicate the field, you'll notice that a force is exerted on this side of the loop, which is upwards. If you do the same thing on the other side, the um, current is coming out of the page, the field is still to the right, and so this side of the loop will experience a force downwards. Now overall, what's the result? If this side of the loop is being pulled upwards and this side of the loop is being pulled downwards, then overall this is going to rotate. It's going to rotate in this direction. Now that's all good and well because um, you'll have your current flowing a certain direction which will cause the motor to flip over. But why then have this split ring commutator? Why does it need to be split? Well the answer is that it needs to be split so that each time the rotation happens, uh, the force is stopped and then started again so that it, it continues to rotate. And it's only going to rotate if each time the motor does a half turn, the direction of the current is reversed. So essentially, each time the motor turns over one time, we we'll reverse the current direction, which causes it to flip again and again and again. And so this could cause this continuous rotating motion, which basically produces a motor. So let's look at one other. Um, so let's look at one other application here, and that's something called a mass spectrometer. Now, a mass spectrometer is essentially just, um, it's, it's a way of either separating or identifying different, um, different elements, whether they be isotopes or, um, or, or different, uh, entirely different elements. So, a mass spectrometer can be used to determine the mass of a particular unknown sample um, as follows. We start with a source, and this source is then accelerated to some sort of speed, so that it is sort of launched through um, into a magnetic field. Now, um, only certain particles will make it through this, what's called a velocity selector, which is to say that if it's not going just the right speed, then it won't make it through this um, velocity selector. So we know that when they come out the other side, they're going to have a very specific speed. And um, we can calculate that speed based on, the, um, based on the known charge. Now, as a result, these particles then travel into a uniform magnetic field. And because we know the field that they're traveling at, and... Sorry, and because we know the speed that they're traveling at and the strength of the field, they will then start to move in um, circular motion. And because they're going to travel in a circular motion, they'll make complete a perfect half circle before finally colliding with the um, with the detector, which we placed along this wall here. So, think about this. 
um, how can we use this to determine the mass of an unknown sample? How could just knowing um, the speed and the strength of the field and the charge on these, how would that allow us to calculate the mass of this unknown sample? Now, another application of mass spectrometers is actually to separate substances into individual isotopes. So, for example, if you were to find uranium naturally in nature, you'd find it as a mix of uranium-238 and of 235. But what you'd find is that almost entirely the sample would be uranium-238, which is a relatively inert and uh, not very radioactively, uh, not very radioactive. By comparison, uranium-235 is, is highly radioactive and can be used in things like uh, nuclear reactors or even nuclear weapons. So if you have a sample of uranium, it'll be a mixture of the uranium-238 and the uranium-235. So how could putting it through a mass spectrometer, how could we use that then to separate it out so we have a sample of pure uranium-238 and another sample of pure uranium-235? So think about the answers to those two questions and we'll go over them in class the next day.